our Cisco routers and switches. Just a little bit of information about uh, New Horizons if you are new to us. We are a proven worldwide training provider offering flexible learning solutions covering a broad spectrum of topics taught by a large group of industry leading instructors. We are a large international network consisting of 2,100 classrooms, 2,400 instructors in 56 different countries. And we provide 3 million student days of training per year. And with respect to Cisco, we also happen to be Cisco's largest worldwide training partner as well. Now, as I mentioned, we do provide flexible learning solutions, so a series of integrated learning methods, including what we call typical ILT, instructor-led training, students in a physical classroom with an instructor present, online live, which is online uh, virtual the delivery, it is distance learning with students connected via the internet to again uh, an instructor who is hosting that class in an online classroom and uh, private group training as well customized for your company. Well our audience today likely consists of network admins and technology leaders that find themselves in increasingly complex environments where network connectivity is considered absolutely mission critical for success. Today we're going to be identifying some single points of failure within our infrastructure both at layers two and three and we'll be discussing and demonstrating the features and functions that will allow you to create a fully redundant fault tolerant network with your Cisco routers and switches. Now I thought as well that since this is a lunch and learn, I would try to keep things uh, kind of engaged and as opposed to maybe killing you with death by PowerPoint during lunch, I thought we would probably tend to engage more in a demonstration of some of these technologies. So I have some simulation tools that we'll be using so I can show you how these commands do truly work. Our agenda basically consists of a number of different questions, including, first of all, how do fault tolerant networks contribute to the goals of the network admin? How do we eliminate the risk of single points of failure that are associated with our trunks, our switch to switch interconnections? We'll also talk about the consequence of increasing the number of trunk ports and how this can be avoided with a loop avoidance mechanism called spanning tree protocol. We'll also talk about how we can achieve increased trunking performance while also stabilizing our layer two infrastructure with ether channel. Then we're going to shift our focus away from layer two and more into IP layer three, looking at how we overcome a single point of failure represented by that one single default gateway IP address that our endpoint devices are given as part of their configuration. And we'll take a look at a way that we can kind of take fuller advantage of a redundant secondary router by practicing some load balancing as well. And we'll talk about kind of some next steps where we go from here as well. Again, as Brian mentioned, my name is Adam Griffith. I'm a regional, regional senior technical instructor with New Horizons based out of Columbus, Ohio. Go Bucks. I'm a certified Cisco network professional and a certified Cisco systems instructor uh, with approximately 25 years in IT with a focus on manufacturing. I've uh, had the benefit of working for some very, very uh, large companies as well as some very, very small, very progressive companies as well. Uh, interesting fact about me, I first obtained my CCNA certification all the way back in 1997. And I spent uh, 11 years as an independent systems consultant, followed by uh, 10 years in IT management. Now, as I mentioned, the need for redundancy really kind of springs out of some of those essential goals of network administration, including 
reliability, availability or uptime, and scalability, which is the readiness for growth. So again, our high performance fault tolerant networks help us to achieve these goals. Let's start our conversation though at layer two. Layer two, let's find the single point of failure here with our switches, here with Ethernet. Well, as our networks do tend to grow, we have of course seen a proliferation of the number of different network connected devices out there. It's not just simply PCs and servers and printers anymore. It goes well beyond that. And so we have to have an increasing number of switches to accommodate that growth of our network. So these switch to switch interconnections, again, these are referred to as trunks, they are increasingly burdened with more and more ethernet frames. Now, in addition, these trunks could also present a single point of failure at layer two. So the solution here is to simply increase or add additional trunk ports. Let's take a look at what happens. Now, if you are one of my students, you will uh, certainly have the opinion that I like to John Madden up my slides. Let me do a little bit of uh, drawing here real quick to kind of demonstrate what this consequence of adding additional trunk ports is truly going to be. Let me draw some switches here. Now, in addition to John maddening up my slides, um, it's also pretty quick to see that I am not a professional artist by trade. Imagine that. Let me just draw four switches here. And again, as opposed to connecting these four switches kind of in serial or daisy chaining them, one to the other, to the other, to the other. Let me build some redundancy here. Let me take switch one here and get rid of that. Let me label switch two, switch three, and switch four. There we go. So let me provide a connection here, a trunk port between one and two, another between one and three, how about another between two and four, and another between three and four. So there we go, each switch is connected to its two neighbors here, thereby giving me two options, two different paths to forward frames in my layer two network. But let's take a look at the consequence. And this is not a likelihood. This is an inevitability if we don't have some sort of mechanism to prevent it. Let me attach an endpoint PC to switch one here. Now again, I know what you're thinking already. Hey, PCs haven't looked like that in a couple of decades. I know, I just can't seem to draw them any other way. So my PC here connected to switch one is going to send a broadcast message out. Send a broadcast message to switch one, the switch it is connected to. Switch one will recognize that that is a broadcast frame. And simply by definition, the switch says, well, it's, it's a broadcast. Therefore, I must flood that broadcast out all of my interfaces except the one that I received it in on. So switch one sends that broadcast to switch three and also sends it over here to switch two. Switch two then says, hey, I just received this broadcast. By definition, a broadcast needs to go to everyone. So I have to take that broadcast and forward that out all interfaces except the one that it came in on, which means that switch two is going to Send that over here to switch four. Well, switch four also says, hey, this is a frame. I have to send that out. That is a broadcast frame, that is. I'm going to send that out all of my interfaces. I'm going to send that to switch three. But of course, switch three already got it. Switch three then says, hey, it's a broadcast. I have to send it out. 
all interfaces. And so it sends it around again. And so this continues, this loop continues with this broadcast message. So we see the same frame interpreted multiple times. We also see this broadcast storm that is just starting here continue to kind of increase in size, eventually reaching critical mass and beginning to overload and overwhelm these switches to the point that they become unresponsive to our actual important network traffic. We also see the MAC tables on these switches become unstable and uh, really, again, uh, unable to be useful because we see the same MAC address is showing up from multiple interfaces. So the MAC address becomes unstable and unusable as a result. So we increase the number of those trunk ports to avoid that single point of failure between two switches, but as a result we've introduced now the inevitability of a broadcast turning into a broadcast storm and beginning to seriously impact our layer two network performance. Our solution therefore is SDP, spanning tree protocol. Spanning tree protocol is a loop avoidance mechanism. Now that loop avoidance mechanism places one or more of those trunk ports, one or more of those interfaces into a blocking state. By using a standard mathematic algorithm to elect a root bridge, a primary switch in our layer two and environment here. So let me quickly kind of sketch out what spanning tree protocol is going to do here as well. Let me draw my four switches again. The longer I draw, the worse they seem to get. All right, so switch one, switch two, switch three, and switch four. Let me draw those trunk ports back in here again. All right, so this time, spanning tree protocol is going to elect again a root bridge. A root bridge, it actually uses a value called the bridge ID or the bid. Only in this case, the lowest bid is the winner and the lowest bid becomes the, the master switch, if you will. Well, on our switches by default, they all have the same bridge ID by default. That bridge ID is 32768, and our bridge ID value can be anything from 0 to 65,535. So who ends up being the root bridge ends up being kind of a tie. We'll take a look at what that looks like here in just one second. But let's take a look at, in this case, Let's say that spanning tree has decided to block this interface here on switch three. Now, again, what's going to happen when that broadcast goes out? Well, first of all, one is certainly going to send that to two. One is going to send that again to switch three. 2 is going to send that to switch 4. Notice though, switch 3 would really like to send that out to switch 4 as it did before. Only in this case, nope, not permitted. That interface is in a blocking state. Switch 4 now again wants to share that broadcast, sends it out, the interface connected to switch 3. But again, that interface on switch 3 is in that blocking state. So again, that is blocked there as well. This avoids that inevitable loop. Now there are multiple types of spanning tree protocols out there. Spanning tree is not uh, an invention on Cisco's part. Spanning tree actually originated from the IEEE as a standard, an open standard called CST, Common Spanning Tree. Cisco, however, did improve upon the Common Spanning Tree protocol by giving us PVST plus, which is per VLAN spanning tree, as opposed to taking one of these interfaces and putting it in a 
full-time blocking state, PBSD Plus actually allows interfaces to be blocking for some VLANs, allowing traffic for others. So it more accurately, more adequately utilizes the bandwidth as opposed to just essentially in this case common spanning tree shutting that interface completely off. Now the good news about spanning tree protocol or in this case PBST plus per VLAN spanning tree that is deployed automatically on your Cisco Catalyst switches. Deployed automatically. However enhanced control is likely to be advantageous. Let me bring my simulator up here and I'm going to show you what I mean here. All right, so in the simulation, let me zoom in a little bit. I have four switches. Clearly, I have one up at the top that is my core switch. The others are edge switches, but I've also provided a link between them as well. So again, I can see where I have constructed some physical re redundancy here. Take a look though at that core switch at the top. I see that the interfaces on those edge switches are all green and with this simulation that means that those interfaces are up and operational. Switch zero though, which again happens to be my core switch in this example, has two interfaces that are in that blocking state. I see they show up orange here in the simulator. Let's investigate that. get into privileged exec and let's take a look at what's going on here. Show spanning tree VLAN 1. All of my switches are in their default VLAN 1 configuration. I haven't created any VLANs for this example just to keep it simple for us. So if I take a look at the output here, there's my bridge ID, my bridge priority. And again, low cost win. So 24,577 in this case. Now if I look down here below at the interfaces that are participating in spanning tree, or in this case not participating, I see that my fast Ethernet 03 interface is actually pointing to the root switch. So in this case, my core switch is not my root switch which is unfortunate. That's where all of my layer two switching power truly is. My core switch is likely the one that I want to be that master switch, that root bridge. So FA03, if I have my physical topology here, actually points to switch three. Let's do a little investigation here as well. Didn't want to get there just yet. Show spanning tree for VLAN 1. Again, this is PVST+. Plus. So this tells me that, in this case, switch 3 is my root switch, is my root bridge. Now again, control is advantageous. My core switch here should be my root. That's the one that I want to be my root. Let me influence that. Now, global config, I'm going to use a command here, spanning tree, VLAN 1, and I'm going to tell switch 0 here, my core switch, you are the root primary. That will automatically adjust that bridge priority. It causes a new election of spanning tree. Let me close this out. It usually takes a second. You can already kind of see from the simulation some of those interfaces are changing their state from that forwarding state to a blocking state. So I've already seen some change going on. Let me let the environment kind of restabilize. Now meanwhile, while spanning tree is recalculating taking interfaces and maybe putting them back into a forwarding state, taking others, putting them into a blocking state, there is sort of a, a momentary pause in my layer 2 network traffic. 
So although spanning tree is a necessary loop avoidance mechanism, we don't want it recalculating any more than it absolutely positively has to. Because again, there is a performance impact there. Okay, so now we see that the core switch, all of its interfaces are now active and forwarding, and the blocking interfaces have changed. Now I have an interface on switch one and on switch two that's in that blocking state. Let me confirm that. Let me go back to switch zero here. Let me take a look at my spanning tree configuration. Now take a look. Switch zero is my root switch. All of its interfaces are in that forwarding state. Now, as I mentioned, spanning tree protocol, when that recalculation occurs, the election has to occur all over again. Now, obviously, you saw where I just rigged the election to always make my core switch the root bridge. But any sort of change in the layer two topology actually re-triggers that spanning tree election process. And again, that there is a performance impact there. I don't want spanning tree calculating any more than is absolutely necessary. Now also as my network grows, I may look to add additional trunks to try to increase the amount of bandwidth between my switches as well. The problem with that with spanning tree protocol is the more trunk ports that I have, the more of those interfaces end up in a blocking state. So the more I try to kind of overcome that issue, the more spanning tree shuts some of those interfaces essentially off. So let's take a look at ether channel. Ether channel. Ether channel is a protocol that provides for stability in our layer two network, preventing spanning tree protocol from recalculating if there is a minor change in our layer two topology. And also ether channel is a nice side effect, also allows us to fully utilize the bandwidth of multiple trunk ports and load balances across those multiple trunk ports as well. So we look at spanning tree protocol as, again, a way to avoid those loops in our redundant layer two networks. Ether channel now extends that even further by providing us with load balancing and stability to make sure that spanning tree doesn't just recalculate on a whim. So in this scenario, I have two switches here. Say switch one and switch two. I originally had just one trunk between those two, but again, that created a single point of failure. I then added a second trunk port, a second trunk interface there to, again, provide me with a redundant fault tolerant option, but we saw that those loops can occur and STP prevents those. What if later on I decide, you know, I really want more bandwidth between these two switches? Let me dial this up to three trunks between these two devices. Again, in doing that, spanning tree is going to recalculate, put some different interfaces in that blocking state. If at some point in time later, what if one of these interfaces or one of the, the connecting media here happens to fail? Again, technically that would be a layer two topology change causing spanning tree to run the election process again. All right, let's bring my simulation up. Let me open up the scenario that I've got here. All right, so I have two switches. Let me do a little zoom here for you as well. Here we go. 
So I created a second trunk for a redundant option. Let those refresh here. So I will see spanning tree likely put one of those interfaces here in just a moment in a blocking state. There we go. So I see three of those interfaces are actively forwarding. I see one there on switch one has been put into a blocking state. Now again, what if I decide to increase the amount of bandwidth by adding a third trunk? Now again, we'll see that is a layer two topology change. Spanning tree right now is recalculating to again figure out interfaces should be actively forwarding and which ones should now be blocking. If I were to take one of those out, we would see again spanning tree run again. So how can I take these three trunks and combine them together to give me again redundancy and fault tolerance while again also giving me full utilization of that bandwidth and stability. Let me open up the command line here. I'm essentially going to take those three trunk ports and I'm going to team them up. I'm going to make them operate as a group. We call it a channel group or a port channel. All right, to do that, I'm going to create that virtual port channel. I'm going to do that by choosing all of those three trunk ports here. Now for me that happens to be FA01 through 3. So there we go. I'm in interface range configuration mode for all three of those interfaces. And I'm going to use the channel group command. Channel group. I'm going to create a new channel group called channel group 1. And I'm going to set its mode to on. Now, notice in doing that, my interface status has changed. So now if I take a look at those three interfaces here, let me scroll back up. I'll see those are up right now. Eventually I will see those up. Uh, be administratively down or be down at the moment as well. So they're changing their status. All right, so I'm not quite there yet. Now I need to go into interface configuration mode for this new port channel interface that I just created, this new teamed interface I created with these three ports on my switch here. So this is interface, and I could spell it out port dash channel one, but I like to be terse. So interface, whoops, Let me try spelling it out here. Whoop. Mode matters. Mode matters. I've been around Cisco switches for long enough. I still end up doing that. All right, so let's try that again. Interface, PO1. There we go. And now I'm going to tell this teamed interface that you are a trunk. So I'm going to put that port channel interface in trunk mode. All right, so that takes care of that on switch zero. I have to do the very same thing over here on switch one, though. Let me close that command line. Let me open up switch one. And I'm going to do the very same thing. I'm going to select the interface range, which happens to be the same three interfaces. I'm going to create a channel group, channel group one, and turn that on. Then I'm going to get into interface configuration mode for that port channel. I'll spell it all out this time. All right, so there we go. I'm in interface configuration mode for port channel one that I just created. And again, I'm going to put that in 
trunk mode, switch port mode trunk. All right, let me exit the command line here. Give this a moment or two to refresh. What we're going to see is that this will be looked at logically as one interface on one switch connected to one interface on the other switch. As a result, logically, there will be no reason to put a physical trunk here in a blocking state. So we see that now I have all three interfaces on both switches completely operational. In addition, in this case, they're fast Ethernet, so I have in theory, a 300 megabit per second trunk between these two switches here as well. And if I were to, well, let's say I'm going to go ahead and delete one of these. I'm going to disconnect one of these cables. So I just unplugged one of those physical interfaces from the channel group from ether channel. Notice again, spanning tree does not recalculate. All right, let's shift our attention to layer three now. Now that we've taken a look at uh, why we need some redundancy and some fault tolerance at layer two and the mechanisms that we use to create, support, manage, and maintain that. Let's shift our focus to the network layer, to IP here, layer three. Now, some of our protocols within layer three already have some semblance of redundancy built into them. Our dynamic routing protocols, for instance, they are actually there to allow us to share information, to learn about changes in our layer three topology. That way routers have the best, most accurate information for good solid path and determination choices. And they make that de determination on a per packet basis. So there's a semblance of redundancy and fault tolerance by nature with our dynamic routing protocols. However, the problem here in this case doesn't really rest with our router necessarily. It's with our endpoint device. When we configure an endpoint PC, for instance, I give it an IP address a subnet mask, and a default gateway IP address. And in most cases, that tends to be a router, maybe a layer three switch, but in most cases, maybe a router. The problem is, is that I can't give that endpoint PC any more than one single default gateway IP address. Not like DM, I can specify a primary and a secondary and a tertiary or a quaternary. With default gateway, it's one IP address only. And there is no easy way to easily switch all of your clients to a secondary router if your primary router fails or if any of the interfaces that you're tracking on that primary router happen to fail. So if the router is still alive and well, but the primary WAN connection, that's a tracked interface, and you see that primary WAN link drop, Again, there would be no way to move that traffic from the endpoint device, from the client, to some secondary router, not easily at least. Our solution, therefore, is called HSRP. HSRP, Hot Standby Router Protocol. Now, HSRP is a Cisco proprietary protocol for creating a group of routers consisting of an active primary router, an active primary router that is actively forwarding, and one or more standby or failover routers that are basically there in case that primary fails. Now, there is an open standard equivalent to HSRP as well. So if you have a uh, maybe a multi-vendor environment at the uh, router level, then you could opt for VRRP, Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol, which is very, very uh, e e equivalent to HSRP, but again, it would be a multi-vendor solution. So we'll look at it from, again, the Cisco point of view with HSRP. HSRP is going to allow us to create 
a single default gateway that happens to be a virtual default gateway. And so now that virtual default gateway is going to have a single IP address. And that IP address is the one that I will give my endpoint devices. The active router will assume the packet forwarding actions of that virtual default router. If the active router ever happens to, again, fail, the standby router monitors that status of the active router and will assume the job of packet forwarding, again, if that active router becomes inoperable. Now, the standby router actually maintains uh, a heartbeat on that active router. It's called the hello dead interval. When we establish a, a group or a team of routers in this case, we'll see that they'll agree on a hello dead interval. As the standby router, this is the amount of time that I'm willing to wait to not hear an acknowledgement back from the active router that it's still there until I will declare it to be dead and then I will promote myself as the standby router into that active role. Let's take a look at how that's configured. All right, again, in this case, we're going to use two routers. We're going to establish a connection between those two routers. We're going to put IP addresses on those two interfaces. But again, we'll see these two routers teaming up to create this virtual router. Now, who's actually, again, performing the functionality for this virtual router will be based upon, again, who is the active and who is the standby. But this is what the virtual, this is what I point my endpoint devices to. And if the active router does happen to go offline or its WAN link goes offline, then again, the endpoint device is completely unaware that now the standby router is performing the actual packet forward and the actual path and the determination choices on behalf of that virtual router. So our endpoint devices are completely unaware that this active and standby, these two routers or more routers could again move through these different states. Let me get my scenario here. All right, so pretty simple. I've just got uh, two routers. have them linked with their gigabit interfaces. Let me start the configuration here for router one. All right, to do that, I'm going to get into interface configuration mode for that gigabit interface. I'm going to put an IP address on that interface. Let me stick with something simple. How about 10.10.10.10.2? And we'll make this a slash 24. All right, so there we go. I put an IP address on that interface. Let me tell it that it is going to be part of a standby group, standby group number one. And the IP address of that standby group is going to be 10.10.10.1. So that is going to be the IP address used by this virtual router that we're creating. Now I want router one here to be my active router. So I'm going to set a priority level. Oops, almost forgot the one here. Set a priority level on it. This router will take precedence. And I'm also going to use one more command here called standby, and again, the number of the standby group one, preempt. Now that preempt command actually tells router one in this case, again, you can invoke that active role. If you don't have that preempt command utilized, then the router that boots first ends up being the active router. So preempt would prevent that, making sure that that priority is established. Again, without that preempt, the first router becomes the active router, whether or not uh, that priority level says so or not. So it ignores that, that priority level. 
All right, so this is a router. All my interfaces are administratively down by default, so I better do a no shutdown command. And there we go. Change that interface to enabled. Jump over here to router 2, and I'm going to do the, essentially the same thing. So I'm going to give this an IP address of 10.10.10.3. And let me kind of cut to the chase here a little bit. All right, there we go. So I see those interfaces are now operational. Let's confirm that worked here. Let me do a show standby command. So we see right now the current state is speak. So these two routers are having a little bit of a conversation to figure out who is the active and who is the standby. So it looks like that uh, router one just changed into that active role. Let me do a show standby again here. There we go. So router one is my active router. I take a look at router two. Oh, you know what? I just realized what I forgot. Looking back up to those commands, I forgot to establish the IP address of that virtual router. So let me get back into interface mode here for gig zero zero. I try to take just one shortcut too many there. All right, so there we go. Now router two is talking. And again, I'll probably see some syslog events show up here at the command line momentarily. Fair enough, there we go. Let me that command again. Router two is now the standby. So router one is now performing the active forwarding for that virtual router if it happens to fail. Again, we'd see router two promote itself from the standby router to the active router once that hello dead interval expires. The problem that we see with HSRP though is that the HSRP standby router essentially just sits there dormant until it's needed. That's a significant capital investment sitting in the rack just waiting on the primary router to in fact fail. The only extent that we can really configure HSRP with load balancing is by assigning the active and standby roles on these two different routers on a per VLAN basis. So per VLAN load balancing which isn't really load balancing in its purest sense. This is sort of me figuring out who my higher traffic VLANs are and distributing those. Saying that one router is active for one VLAN but standby for an another VLAN. Better still is Cisco's proprietary GLBP protocol, Gateway Load Balancing Protocol. 
it takes full advantage of that standby router in either an equal or unequal cost configuration. Now, if I'm doing equal cost load balancing, that means that both of those routers are connected to WAN links that are equally strong. Both of those routers are just as capable of forwarding those packets. So round robin load balancing then would be used to essentially just alternate the active and standby router roles with each successive packet. So packet number one is forwarded by router one. Packet number two forwarded by router two. Packet three forwarded by router one and so on and so forth. Now if I have potentially on that secondary router maybe a weaker WAN link. Maybe I'm paying for maybe a DSL connection as opposed to MPLS on my primary router. So I really don't want to drive equal amounts of packets over both of those routers. I can do with GLBP, I can do unequal cost load balancing. Secondary connection is 10 times or maybe again 10 percent of my primary connection. Then again for every 10 packets that I move across that faster primary connection unequal cost would allow me to move one packet on that slower connection, at least getting some sort of functionality out of that slower link. Now GLBP is a significant advantage for our Cisco routers right now. There is currently no open standard equivalent for GLBP. Let me quickly show you how that is configured. You're going to see that the configuration is not really dramatically different from HSRP. In fact, I'll just show you kind of one side of it here. Again, I'm going to get into interface configuration mode, put an IP address on that interface. Again, I'm going to keep it simple, 10.10.10.2 slash 24 there. The command now in this case is not standby, but it's GLBP. GLBP1, or my GLBP group number one. And I'll specify the IP address of that virtual router. Let me get out of there we go. GLBP1 uh, It looks like this scenario might be a little bit flawed here. Well, because we're running out of time, uh, again, the configuration would look just like HSRP, only I would use GLBP commands here to specify, again, the IP address of that virtual router, specifying the priority, uh, using that preempt command, and then I would follow that up with another command called GLBP, is again one for my group, and the type of load balancing that I want to use. Again, assuming this is an equal cost configuration, use round robin there. All right, so what's next for you? Where do we go from here? Next steps that I would recommend would be number one, assessing your current network infrastructure, looking for any single points of failure in your environment at both layer two and layer three. Submit a qualitative and quantitative risk assessment to senior leadership so you have their buy-in. Invest in the appropriate infrastructure devices and potentially additional media, some of those additional connections that we may need to support the physical topology change in the environment that's going to be required for fault tolerance. Deploy the concepts and techniques then that we've presented here to create redundancy again both at layer 2 Ethernet and layer 3 IP. Then you'll need to develop those skills necessary to manage your network and provide 
those desired levels of availability, reliability, and scalability. So the concepts that we've looked at today actually come from two different curriculums. The CCNA routing and switching curriculum is presented in two classes, ICND1 and ICND2, or the combined accelerated CCNAX. Trunking, spanning tree protocol, and ether channel all covered there in a practical hands-on way. And CCNP, Certified Cisco Network Professional Routing and Switching, specifically the route class there. Hot standby, router protocol, HSRP, and gateway load balancing protocol, GLBP, again, both of those covered practically hands-on there as well. HSRP and GLBP are featured in CCNA routing and switching, but purely from a conceptual standpoint. Again, I appreciate your attention. Hope that uh, that did demonstrate some of those options for building our fault tolerant network. Let me go ahead and open it up for questions. And if anyone has any questions, they can go ahead and put it in the chat box. I can relay them to Adam. <clears throat> to Adam. Um, also, I did include the handout in the um, handout section. So if you wanted to the slides um, in our section. So if you want to see the slides or have them for your future reference, they are there. You can download them as well. Um, Adam, it doesn't look like there's any questions. I do know that you do need to get back to another class. So I'd like to first thank everyone for attending the webinar today um, and also thank Adam for presenting the webinar today. We truly appreciate it and we hope to see everyone next time around at our next, uh, next, next level webinar. So thank you again, Adam, and uh, everyone have a great day. Thanks, Brian, so much. Thanks, folks, for, again, taking time to be here. Have a great day. Hope to see you in a future Cisco class.